Hey everyone, my name is Susan Niner, and I okay. am the former um, Deputy Director at the Colorado Division of Housing. Um, just to share a little bit with you about my history, um, I worked at um, both a, um, the ARC of New Jersey, um, working with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, after that, I had a position at a community mental health center here in Colorado at Pikes Peak Mental Health Center, where I ran um, the housing program there. Um, after that, I moved to the state um, and worked with the state of Colorado for over 20 years, um, primarily in their assisted housing program. So my, my core knowledge is really about um, Section 8 public housing, um, types of housing that, that have rental assistance, um, and then primarily um, both the HUD programs and the state programs. Um, did that for, my gosh, I think it was 24 years and recently retired. Um, so I've been retired for about a year and a half now and doing um, whatever I can with CCDC whenever I can. Um, so I think before I get started, I will um, sh do a shout out to the Division of Housing who um, certainly helped me um, as I put together some of the, these resources. I reached out to them, so I want to make sure to thank them for their help. Um, and I think what we're going to do today is going to be really surface, really generic, um, talk a little bit about some housing resources, make sure we, we all kind of understand the same language. Um, delve a little bit into the COVID-19 resources, and then spend a few minutes talking about reasonable accommodation. Um, that's always important, but it's super important now, given um, everything that's going on with the COVID-19 and the, you know, things being closed and not having access to different things. And so I want to touch a little bit on what reasonable accommodation is, just so folks are thinking as they're going through their life and as they're experiencing mandates from their landlords and different things, um, how they might be able to um, ask for assistance or ask for different things. So hopefully um, that tells you a little bit about me and what we're going to do today. I would love for this to be as interactive as possible. And so um, I'm gonna just say, ask me any questions you have whenever you have them. Um, I'm a talker, as you can tell, so I'll be happy to fill the space. Um, if, if you are not, um, I'm going to, um, we'll just jump in. Um, so I think um, a lot of when you're out searching for housing, you're wondering what kind of housing is available to you. Um, we have to be really careful the language we use. So a lot of people will say, for example, I want a Section 8, I need Section 8 because I need help paying for my rent. Well, Section 8 absolutely is a great program and it does help you pay part of your rent, but there are a lot of other programs that are equally as good. They can also help you pay your rent. So um, I just wanted to kind of talk through each one of these today, make sure that you know about them. Um, again, feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Um, first one's public housing. So public housing is kind of what we all think of when we think 20, 30 years ago, the big high rises, the projects, um, they're sometimes called. Public housing is project-based housing. So it's gonna be housing um, where you only get the rental assistance as long as you live in that particular building, in that particular apartment. If you move, you don't get the rental assistance. So in that case, the rental assistance is attached directly to a specific unit in a specific building, in a specific neighborhood. Um, so that might not be the neighborhood you want, might want to live in. It might not be the best unit, although some public housing units are great, um, especially here in Colorado. We're really rebuilding and refreshing, and, and a lot of the public housing units are, are, are quite nice and quite new. Um, but I always say, get in the door. Get in the door, get some rental assistance, get some stability with your finances, and then you can always look for other programs, assuming that maybe public housing might be the only option available to you at that moment. Um, housing Choice Voucher Program, that's Section 8. Everybody knows it. Um, and that can be tenant-based or project-based. 
So sometimes if you get a Section 8 voucher, they will say to you, you have to live in this building in this unit. You just have to. Um, in other cases, you'll be given a voucher that you can take out into the community, any community you'd like, with any landlord that's willing to accept it. So um, uh, two different ways you can get Section 8. Um, the next is project-based housing. So things like 811 program, 202 program. So the 811 program is again, a project base. So again, you're only gonna get that subsidy when you live in that particular building in that particular apartment. Um, 811 is for um, individuals with disabilities. And the 202 program is um, primarily for seniors, although I also think um, persons with disabilities um, are, are eligible um, for 202 units. Um, continuum of care funding, that is funding that comes from HUD, but kind of comes under the homeless umbrella. So you've got like the rental assistance umbrella from HUD where all there's all kinds of programs under that. And then you've got this other umbrella, which is the continuum of care funding, which is homeless programs. So if you are an individual who's experiencing homelessness, you might want to um, really look into those continuum of care dollars. Um, and, and at some point we could probably do a whole webinar on continuum of care funding and how to access it. I'm just kind of, like I said, doing a, a surface look at things today. Um, something I want to bring your attention to is state housing vouchers. Um, so the state of Colorado funds the D Colorado Division of Housing to um, provide rental assistance that very much mirrors Section 8. So again, it can be tenant-based, it can be project-based, um, but the funding comes from the state rather than from HUD. Um, I think the thing that's important here um, when you look at all of these different types of rental assistances, where do I go to get them? Um, so you, we have in the state of Colorado and across the country what are called public housing authorities. So um, most, city, most counties, some cities and counties, so for example, there is, let's take Jefferson County because I think that's a really good example. If you live in Jefferson County, there's a Jefferson County Housing Authority there is the Arvada Housing Authority. There is the West Metro Housing Authority. Um, and, so you, and then there's the Division of Housing that is across the whole state. So there are lots and lots of public housing authorities, all of which have some or all of these um, programs. If you are a person with a disability and you are connected to services through a community mental health center, or through a community center board um, or, or some other homeless providers, um, you may have access to the Colorado Division of Housing's housing programs. So for example, let's say I'm a client of the Mental Health Center of Denver. Um, the Mental Health Center of Denver is a contractor for the Department of, uh, for the Division of Housing. And so you really wanna ask, where's the housing office? Go to that housing office, speak to them. Um, and before I move on, just something even more general from this picture, we have all of these different programs. So if you were to call a housing authority and say, is your Section 8 list open? My fear is they're gonna tell you no, but their public housing list might be open or they may have some state housing vouchers. So when you're calling, when you're looking for housing, use a more general term. Say um, that you're looking for rental assistance. If you use that rental assistance term, that's going to make the person on the other end think about what types of rental assistance may, may be good for you. So, so again, we could do a, re a webinar on each one of these, and maybe at some point CCDC will want to do that, and I'd be happy to help. Um, but let's move on a little bit to COVID-19 resources, um, because we know there are lots and lots of people that are struggling right now. Um, I, I want to mention the state's 211 system. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with it, but if you are not um, in, in, in the state of Colorado, in anywhere, you can pick up the phone and you can dial 911, right? And you know that that is going to get you emergency medical police assistance. Well, in the state of Colorado, we have 211. So you can pick up your phone and dial 211 just like you can 911, and you're going to um, 
reach a, a person on the other side of the phone that is really good at referrals. They understand what is happening in the state. They know where available shelters are, where food banks are, um, just a, a, a plethora of resources. So um, it's always a great place to start. Um, they'll give you they'll give you names. They'll give you numbers. You you can look, um, but it will really it'll really sort of start start your search. Um, we were a little bit late to the game, um, so we didn't have a chance to test this. Um, so let's see if this works. Can so um, this is a place that I have found that has a really good list. So the Denverite is a great organization and they have put all of these resources in one place for you. Um, and it, it, it's just really super easy to navigate. Um, so for example, the Division of Housing. So I've talked a lot about the Division of Housing. I used to work for the Division of Housing. Um, they have set aside, I believe it is $3 million to help with emergency rental assistance. And if you click on that link in the, um, if you click on the link in that article, it, it brings up your state of Colorado eviction prevention program. And so literally you can type in your address. So let's say we live in Grand Junction. The map is going to take us to Grand Junction and they're gonna tell you exactly where to go in Grand Junction to get assistance. So you'll see on the left-hand side, local programs, Grand Valley Catholic Outreach, um, and then also Brothers Redevelopment and the Salvation Army. So if you live in, in um, Grand County, in Grand Junction, there are three organizations that can possibly help you with rental assistance. And so you can do that for the entire state. So I think that is a great resource. Um, in this article, they also list um, other, uh, um, sorry, other resources um, for rental assistance. So, and, and this was put together by the Apartment Association. So great list. You see the Department of Local Affairs, community resources, different nonprofits that, that have programs. So um, again, just a lot of really great resources. Um, if you live specifically in the city and county of Denver, um, you should be contacting 311 instead of 211. 311 is the Denver um, line. Um, and you're going to want to access their TRUA program, T-R-U-A, which stands for Temporary Rental and Utility Assistance Program. So um, if you live in the city and county of Denver, you have um, yet another resource that may not be available to someone um, that doesn't live in, in Denver. Um, there are different human services. Um, the 211 site that I spoke to earlier, there's a link there. Um, so you can access um, for your specific zip code for your city. Um, as you'll see here, they have a COVID-19 pandemic link. They have crisis and emergency link that you can click on. Um, so, so just a, an absolute um, wealth of information can be found there. So um, the, you can probably um, do a simple search for the Denverite on resources for tenants struggling to pay the rent and you'll get the story. Um, or um, as you can see, um, I have the um, link here in the PowerPoint, which I assume we will get um, linked out when this goes out online. So everybody will be able to see um, that specific link. Um, lastly, before I, I leave this slide, um, I wanted to click here if you are a homeowner and are in need of um, assistance paying your mortgage. Let's see if I can get to the top of this article. Um, these are all of America's banks and what they're doing in response. So, right, if your first state bank is your mortgage holder, here's what they're going to do for you. Um, let's see. I think my mortgage is through Wells Fargo. So if I click on the W, 
um, boom, there's Wells Fargo, and there are all the, the resources that are accessible to me as a mortgage holder through Wells Fargo. Um, so again, lots and lots of great information and hopefully um, information that you will find helpful. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on is water, power, and utilities. So um, Excel and, and many, I won't say all, but many of the other states um, utility companies have agreed to the following. No service cutoffs for late or missed payments, no reconnection fees, no fees related to late payments, reconnecting services for customers, excuse me, that have been recently disconnected. They're offering low income payment assistance programs and launching a medical exemption policy. So um, there's a lot happening. There's a lot going on. And so I think if, if you are a person that needs help, um, reach out there. There really is um, a, a lot of resources out there. Um, so that's, that's sort of um, what I have for the COVID resources. Um, let's talk a little bit uh, for the last piece of the COVID resources. If you are lucky enough um, to have one of these um, rental assistance programs under HUD that helps you pay your rent, um, I can't believe I'm going to say these words, but I am, HUD is making everything easier. 25 years of doing HUD programs, I don't think that has ever come out of my mouth. They, uh, hands off and uh, congratulations, because HUD has really embraced this pretty quickly for HUD, right? like it didn't come out until this week, but that's still pretty quick for HUD, HUD time. Um, what are they gonna do? So they are offering waivers. So HUD is exercising their authority to provide PHAs with flexibility to adjust program practices where necessary to prior, pri, prioritize mission critical functions when normal operations are restricted, blah, blah, blah. So what they're saying is we get it. We get that it's really uncomfortable for, or uncomfortable for you to get us maybe, well, let's just go to the next slide. Oh, let me go back here. The most important thing on this slide is what's bolded at the bottom. And what is bolded at the bottom says, contact your PHA to see what waivers they are using. So the good news is HUD came out with this really wide arching, um, just fabulous way to make things easier for everyone. The downside is it's PHA specific, what they do and what they don't do. So HUD says you can do all of these different things, um, but it's up to each individual PHA what things they're going to do. Um, so that, that could be, that could be um, a negative. Um, if you are lucky enough to have a voucher from the Colorado Division of Housing, my former employer, um, I know that they are enacting all. They have taken every waiver that HUD has given and they're enacting all of them. So um, it's my hope that that will happen with other housing authorities across the board, but um, hard to say. So let's talk a little bit about what this means, a waiver. What, what are you talking about, Susan? Um, again, they're gonna make things easier. So the first thing they're gonna make easier is the income verification process. So um, Section 8, all of these different rental assistance programs, they're federal programs, they're bureaucratic, they require a lot. Um, so let's take this um, easier income verification process. In the past, if you were a person that had a job, let's say um, you worked for an insurance company 10 hours a week. So you, you had a little job. Um, and because of the, the virus, the coronavirus, you lost your job. In the past, we as a housing authority would have to reach out to your landlord. We would have to ask your landlord for written proof that they laid you off, that you no longer had a job before we could adjust your rent. Um, and so what HUD said is, no, that's, that's too much. That can take too long. Just take the person's word for it. So if you are a person on one of these rental assistance programs and you've lost your job, you should be able to call your housing department, whoever it is, if they are, are using these waivers, and they should be able to take your verbal report as, as, as truth and move forward. And so that could really, really make things move faster. 
um, briefing. So when you get a new rental assistance, you're required to attend a class, basically, that tells you about the program rules, um, and they're always in person, um, and HUD said, no, we're not doing that. We're socially distancing. So we need to do those things on the phone or over the web. So that, again, is going to be a great, um, uh, just make life easier for everyone. Um, extensions on voucher terms. If you are a person who has a voucher and you have to move for whatever reason, we can, I can only imagine how hard and difficult that would be during these times. Um, the, the waiver will allow you to have a longer time to find a place to live. Right now, you usually have 60 days, and that just sometimes isn't enough. So this is going to make it hopefully really easy for you to um, have enough time to find a place that meets your needs without that stress. Um, allowing longer absences from units. So this is another one where HUD is very strict on how long you can be out of your unit, say in the hospital, say in a rehab facility. Um, and so they are um, doing away with those really strict um, guidelines and they're allowing for longer absences from the unit because maybe you have to go and take care of a loved one and you have to move into your mom's house to take care of her for a, a, a term. Um, so a lot more flexibility around being absent from your unit than we normally see from HUD. Um, and then lastly, inspections, right? Who wants strangers coming into their home at this time? I don't, you don't. Um, so HUD, again, under this waiver, is allowing people to take um, self-certifications. So, you know, we can just get something from the landlord that he certifies that, you know, all of the major systems in the apartment are working and the heat is working. There, there are no, um, no issues with those types of things. So, so, again, this is great information for you to have if you are an individual that's currently on a rental assistance program in case you get a phone call from your, you know, housing authority and it says they're going to come out and do an inspection and, and that makes you not not feel real good because you don't want somebody in your house. You can say to them, hey, I know that HUD is allowing waivers um, for certifications. Can we can we look at that as an option? Okay, so um, that is sort of everything that I have on the COVID. I, I'm sure there's, there's more, um, but hopefully, like I said, that gives us a, a little bit of a taste today and, and then we can always look at other webinars in the future. Um, I am going to spend my next five or six slides in our next half hour talking a little bit about fair housing um, and why it's more important than ever right now. Um, just a little bit of history because I think it's always helpful. Fair the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, which feels like a long time ago, especially depending how old you are. Um, but the, the, the data point that is always mind boggling to me is that disability was not added as a protected class until 1988, which is, was not that long ago. Um, and um, just, it just, it's mind blowing to me that it took that long um, for disability to be added as a protected class. Um, but in 1988, it was, and then in addition, in 1988, um, HUD was given the power to investigate and enforce the act. So in 1968, HUD came up with this great Fair Housing Act, or HUD, they came up with this Fair Housing Act that had no teeth. There was, it didn't matter if people did what they were supposed to do, didn't do what they were supposed to do, there was no, there was no teeth behind it. So in 1988, um, it, it, it labeled disability as a protected class and then in addition it gave HUD the authority to investigate and enforce the act. Um, so that's important. Um, what does the act do? So again I just want to review some of this and then we'll get into the, the nuts and bolts. Um, Title 8 makes it unlawful to refuse to make a reasonable accommodation for a person with a disability. So we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about that. So I'll just go past that for now. The second bullet reads, refuse to permit reasonable modifications for persons with disabilities. Um, so that is um, an individual may use a wheelchair and need a ramp 
Um, and, and this bullet and this part of the Fair Housing, Housing Act says the landlord's got to let that happen, right? That, that's requ a requirement. Um, and then the last bullet on this slide reads, failure to design and construct accessible, adaptable housing after March of 1991. So again, um, 1991, I don't know why it took so long, but at least it, from 1991 forward, buildings need to have ramps and, and automatic doors and, and everything that makes that building accessible to folks. So um, that's what the act did. As I said, we're gonna do some um, reasonable accommodation time. Um, and so I hate this word, it's a big word. I think it's um, a word that um, a lot of times professionals in the professional world that are required to, to do reasonable accommodations know what the word is. Um, but if I am just a tenant and I need my landlord to do something for me, I don't know that I would ever think of the word reasonable accommodation. Um, so when I do trainings with, with folks and, and, and um, if I'm in front of a, a bunch of landlords or I'm in front of a housing authority, I'm always really clear to, to remind them of that, 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 that the tenant is gonna come in and they're gonna make a request and they're probably not gonna use reasonable, I want a reasonable accommodation. They may, and if they do, they're well-educated and then that's great. But I wanna make sure that landlords and housing authorities are listening with the right ear to hear, wow, this person just put a reasonable accommodation request in front of me without ever using the words. Um, so what is a reasonable accommodation? The Fair Housing Act makes it unlawful to refuse to make reasonable accommodations in rules, policies, practices, or services when such accommodations may be necessary to afford a disabled person equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. So here's the important part of this. It, it requires, let's say a landlord, it requires a landlord to make a reasonable accommodation in rules, policies, practices, or services. So that is the landlord's rules, the landlord's policies, the landlord's practices. Um, and so a lot of times landlords will say, well, this is the rule. Well, who, who made that rule? You made that rule. It, it, it's not like this you know, government rule. It's a rule that you made for your apartment complex. And I'm gonna ask you um, to make a, a change in your rule so that I can better access your property. Um, so hopefully that, um, that comes together. Um, why is reasonable accommodation so important? It's the law. Um, so I love this next bu bullet because if I could count how many times I had a landlord say to me, I can't do that. I have to treat everyone the same. If I do that for your person, then I'm, I'm breaking fair housing. So um, again, I've educated a lot of landlords in my 20 plus years. Um, keep in mind, it's okay and actually required for landlords to treat people with disabilities differently under reasonable accommodation. Um, I'll describe the picture. Um, so, so what we're looking at on this next slide is a picture. And there are three pictures on the slide. Um, and it's, the, it's titled Equality Versus Equity. Um, so it's really interesting, um, I think, a really interesting visual. So again, it's titled Equality Versus Equity. It has three pictures. In the first picture, it's, um, there are three boys of varying heights. Um, and they're all given the, a box that's the exact, exact same size to stand on. So in the first image, it's assumed that everyone will be benefit from the same supports. Everyone is being treated equally. So again, they're different heights. They were all given the same box. So in the end, um, only the tallest um, are able to see over the fence. Sorry, I, I mentioned that there's a fence there. So there's a fence, the boys have varying heights there and they were all given the same box, right? So it doesn't work for, for the, the shortest uh, kid. Um, in the second Im image, the individuals are given different supports to make it possible for them to have equal access to the game. They are being treated equitably. So in this picture, 
The tallest person can easily see over the fence and they don't need assistance. Um, the next tallest boy is able to see over the fence to see the game with one box and the shorter child needs two boxes to see the game. So everybody's being treated equitably. Um, the third image is certainly the one that we wish um, and, and is the best outcome always. Um, all three kids can see the game without any supports or accommodations because the cause of the inequity, the fence, was addressed. The systematic barrier was removed. So instead of a wooden fence, there's now a chain link fence that doesn't matter how tall you are, you're able to see through it. So I, I just always like this visualization. It helps me understand equity versus equality. And um, so, okay, let's talk about reasonable accommodations. Um, and what are the required elements for a reasonable accommodation? Again, Dawn and I have done classes on reasonable accommodation where we've spent hours talking about it. And so we're only going to spend about 15 minutes today. Again, doesn't mean we can't do something at a, at a later date. But um, required elements of a reasonable accommodation. There has to be a clearly stated disability. So the first thing I get when I say that is people go, I don't have to tell people what my disability is. Well, yes, you do in this instance. If you are asking for a reasonable accommodation, you need to divulge your disability. Um, and then you need to clearly state the accommodation that you're requesting. And there has to be a link between the two. So that's why they need to know that. So, um, and then the, the, the last bullet says provide supportive medical documentation. Um, so yes, your landlord can ask what your disability is. And yes, they can ask for proof, basically. They can't ask for a lot. Doesn't have to be super detailed. Um, your physician can just say, so, so let, me, let me walk through a couple kind of examples maybe here. Um, so I am a person um, that uses a wheelchair. So I would very clearly state that my disability is a mobility impairment. Um, and the accommodation I'm requesting is, um, let, let's say, let's say, um, let's just say a ramp because that's easy. Um, so uh, I take that back. I'm a person that uses a wheelchair. I have a mobility impairment. I can easily prove that to my landlord. Um, and I am requesting an emotional support animal. So my disability that I provided is that I have a mobility impairment and I want an emotional support animal. Have I clearly linked the disability to the accommodation requested? Probably not because I didn't put forth an emotional disability, related disability, I put a physical disability. So let's, let's flip that and let's say um, that I am a person that suffers from depression. And I have a mental health provider that will clearly write me a, a note saying that, yes, I'm a person that suffers from depression um, and that I'm requesting an emotional support animal. Do you see that link to the disability and the request? Um, really, really easy. Um, so keep that in mind. There always has to be a link between what you're asking for um, and what you need. So let's talk about this in real world COVID-19. So um, we had a building that was um, all seniors and persons with disabilities. So the entire building were, was filled with high needs um, and at risk populations under the COVID-19 um, um, concerns. Um, so the landlord um, who took um, some of the guidance that's been given by the CDC and by others to close all public areas. So, okay, makes sense. You probably want to close the TV room and, you know, some of these other areas where people would be breathing and sitting next to each other. But the landlord went too far in this case and they closed the, the laundry room. Um, and so we've got people with disabilities um, who now many of which had disability related needs to have regular access to a laundry room. Um, and, and the landlord closed it, right? So, okay, here's my disability. Um, I could have um, sores or, or, or other 
um, disability related needs that cause me to have to do laundry on a regular basis. Um, and so our request was open the laundry room. Right, you can provide some sanita sanitation wipes, some cleaning. We don't care if you limit it to one person using it at a time, but you really need to open this. Um, and so we were able to clearly link the disability to the accommodation that we were requesting. Um, and, and I'm happy to say that it was it was passed. Um, and I don't think the landlord was a real bad guy. I think they just got overzealous when they they heard like we have to close everything. People can't be with each other. Um, but they didn't think through how hard it would be for an elderly person or a person with disability to get to a community laundromat, uh, especially in this case, given that the bus services had stopped. So, um, so think about that as you go through your day in these you know, times where rules seem to be changing by the day. Um, keep that in mind. Um, some other common reasonable accommodation requests that we see um, the number one that everybody likes to talk about is um, waiving a no pets policy to allow a service or a companion animal. If you are a person with a disability and if you can link your disability to why you need that service or companion animal, um, then it's no longer a pet. It's a medical device um, and therefore you can't be charged pet rent. You can't be charged a pet deposit. Um, you are, however, responsible for your pet. Any damage your pet does, um, picking up after your pet, all of those types of things. Um, live in aids, that's something else that we see a lot. If you are lucky enough to have one of these vouchers that help you pay your rent um, and you require live in aids, someone to live with you to help care for you, um, that voucher can also pay for that individual that's there to help you pay their rent for their room. Um, again, just connect why you need that living aid, what's your disability. Um, additional bedroom for medical equipment. Um, this is definitely something that is possible. Sometimes people have big um, hospital beds um, and other things that make it um, that they really need an extra room um, for their medical equipment. Um, something we see a lot is an assigned parking space. If you have a mobility impairment, you can ask your landlord to give you a specific parking space. And that specific parking space is for you. It has to be signed for the resident in room 101. Um, so you can get a really specific um, parking place if, 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 that's, if you have that disability related need. Um, extensions on times to locate units, we talked about that. Um, exception utilities. This is something I don't think that's used enough. I know that if you are running an oxygen machine 24-7 or, or running some of these other medical machines, um, your utilities can really be increased. And so know that this is a, an ask that you can make of your housing authority for them to make an exception and provide you with a, a larger um, utility allowance because your, medic, your machines and your medical needs are really pushing that utility bill up beyond what, what they would deem as average. Um, and then another one that's really important is shared housing. Um, again, this is, this is um, a situation where if you're a person with a disability and you need to live in a re roommate situation, which works out really well for a lot of people, um, that is an ask um, that, again, has to be related to your disability, um, but that you can ask your housing provider to allow you to enter into um, not just a, a, a regular lease, but a, a lease that had a roommate. Um, okay, let's talk really quickly about when a landlord can say no. I'm going to say hardly ever. Um, so let's walk through these bullets. When can a housing provider deny a reasonable accommodation? First, the request was not made on or on behalf of a person with a disability. So you can ask for a reasonable accommodation yourself. You can have a family member help you. You can have an advocate from the community help you make that request. It doesn't have to always come specifically from the person. It can come on behalf of the person. Um, if there's no disability related need for the accommodation. So again, if you didn't make that connection between this is my disability and this is why I need it, they can say no. Um, or if the accommodation is not reasonable. And there are two bullets under sort of what HUD or what the DOJ or what is reasonable. 
Um, and if it imposes an undue financial or administrative burden. So if it costs too much, or if it's going to be an administrative burden. So um, here's, here's a, an example that I always use for this case. If I'm a person that uses a wheelchair, I can't throw my trash away. And those huge dumpsters that are in parking lots that have those big lids that need to be, I can't do it. I just can't do it. Um, so I could make the request of my landlord that he comes and, and picks up my trash bag from outside my door every day and puts it in the trash. Now the landlord might say, I can't do that because that's a fun, an administrative burden. I don't have, I'm not on site every day to be able to dump your trash. So maybe what the landlord would come back and say is I can dump your trash three days a week when I have maintenance men on site. So, so that sort of give and take. A lot of times landlords will say it's a financial, it costs too much um, and it doesn't, right? It really doesn't because the cost is, it, it might um, eat into their profits, but it's certainly not an undue financial hardship. Um, and then the last one is it causes a fundamental alteration to their program. So the, 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 the easiest example here is you ask your landlord um, for a reasonable accommodation to provide transportation to the grocery store. Your landlord can say no because that's not their business. They're not transportation people and, and so they, they wouldn't do that. Um, and lastly, tenancy of the resident poses a direct threat to the health and safety of other individuals. Um, this, is, this is a clause that I, I, I often see landlords say, oh, well, they, were, they, they posed a direct threat. No, they were upset and they might have raised their voice. They did not pose a direct threat. Um, so, so that's sort of, in a nutshell, reasons that they can deny. Um, they should never deny your request without sitting down and talking to you, giving you the opportunity to explain what it is you're asking for and what you need. Um, so, so, so keep that in mind. Um, and with that, I know I talk fast. Um, it looks like we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, and I will look to Angela or Dawn on how to unmute folks and... Can I ask a question while we're waiting for that? Yeah, you sure can. Um, I wanted to ask how, like I understand that you, for your county, your city, you look up the public housing authority? Like how do you get started to, to even get signed up for any of these programs? Well, you know, it, um, it's not easy. I'm just going to be honest. It's harder than it should be um, because there is no one place that you can access everything. Um, so one place that you can go, and I have found it to be helpful, is um, HUD has a Colorado website um, that lists all of the different housing authorities. But basically what you need to do is either figure out your county um, and then go out to the housing authorities website um, because they're required to post when they're opening different lists. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a way that you automatically get notified. Um, so the housing team <clears throat> through CCDC, and I'll, I'll put a plug, Dawn, in for our team, for anybody that wants to come and help um, with housing issues, we are, we're definitely looking for folks. Um, we are going to um, hopefully get on the list where housing authorities send us when their lists are open and then we can blast it out. <clears throat> so, so we are looking at, at seeing if we can get that done, but it's, it's legwork, Danielle. It's either calling them or going to their website. Okay, thanks. But it's just, again, using that general term of rental assistance, that way it opens up the whole, the whole list of possible programs. My name is um, Nikki Bishop. I'm a longtime friend of CCDC and um, disability advocate volunteer, but I also work um, full-time at um, All Health Network as a housing specialist and um, housing specialist and housing coordinator and care navigator. Uh, it's kind of, a new position over there and I'm the new I'm the only um, housing specialist for the whole network and so okay. I've just yeah I know <laughs> and um, I just yeah 
I'm, I'm the only one. There's no other housing specialist there. Um, and so I'm sort of just like learning on the fly and figuring things out as I go. I don't have a background in housing, but I do have MSW in social work. And so I just learned how to do the VI SPDAT. And my question for you today is, what do you think is the best, when do you think it's the best, um, oper like best way to run that or best client to run that on? The VI SPDAT? So right. um, I know, I know, not my not my A game, but probably my B minus game. Um, so so the VI SPDAT is an assessment tool, as you know. Um, but for everybody else, it's an assessment tool um, that r is used to rank most in need. Um, and this is generally for access to those continuum of care funding. So when we started, we talked about continuum of care funding um, and that that comes under the homeless umbrella of HUD. Um, well, the, the state of Colorado has adopted this VI SPDAT to use as its tool. So every person um, who is homeless should get a VI SPDAT done on them so that it can be entered into the system. And then basically, um, the more challenges or issues that person has, the higher they're gonna go. So let's say they're a, an individual who's homeless um, and they've been homeless for a year and they also have diabetes and a substance use disorder, right? Like they're gonna float up higher on the list than somebody who's been homeless for a month. Um, so you want to do it on every, theoretically, again, I know that's a big job. Um, you want to do it on anybody that's homeless, but certainly anybody that has, um, gosh, what is the term if you've been homeless for a long time, chronically homeless. So if they meet that chronic homeless definition, then they're definitely going to be a priority to get the VI SPDAT done because they're going to float up high on the list. And then does the VI SPDAT, does that just like fit back resources for the clinician or is it more of just like a referral source? It, 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 is, it is my understanding and I have not worked specifically with the VI SPDAT, but my understanding it is, it is solely and, and I would, you would want to check with an expert and I can give you the name of an expert at the Division of Housing that you could reach out to, um, but they... Um, my understanding is it's specifically used for the coordinated entry, which is access to programs. So they get put on this big list and then um, based on where they fall in that list, they may be eligible for different programs. So the only way to get eligible is to have a VI SPDAT done and be in the system. And then based on where okay, you fall, um, then that, that, that will open up programs to you or not. I see. Okay. And so would they, and I'll, I can probably, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here with you, but um, if you can answer this, um, would they be, would the client be contacted directly or would it go to the clinician? That I don't know. Okay. But All right. Well, I, thank I, you so much though. I, I would contact the um, mile. Uh, what is the, the continuum of care for the Metro agent area? Um, Oh my gosh, how quickly I forget things. Um, I, I would contact the continuum of care for the Denver Metro and it will come to me, I'm sure, in a second. I'll let you know. Any other questions? Okay, awesome. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Okay. Ah, MDHI, the and Metro Denver Homeless Initiative. So MDHI. Um, I think it's .org. You can go out there. Um, they will definitely, Angela, have all of those, or, or, I'm sorry, um, have all of those answers for you. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I would love to get the opportunity to connect with you if we can after, or just to get your email. <laughs> Maybe awesome. I can get some, a little bit of guidance. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Susan, I'm going to try one more time. Can you hear me? Well, Dawn, I think we, uh, we filled our hour, and I think... Um, I am certainly open to doing these and doing different topics. So again, we sort of went 3,000 miles an hour today and, and threw a lot of stuff out there. But um, I think Dawn is open to any thoughts about what people might like to see or, or, or other um, possible presentations. I am. And I'll be contacting you 
about for the web um, presentations. So thank you so much. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Well, I think we'll end this and um, everybody stay safe and wash your hands.